All right. We are coming up on 12 o'clock on the hour. So for everyone who's tuned in, we have an audience poll going. We'd love to get everyone's input there. We'll be using some of the top strategies that folks are, are clicking in that poll to guide the conversation with, with Josh and Jim today. So as we're going through our opening remarks for the next few minutes, uh, definitely encouraged to answer that audience poll and we'll get over to those strategies in just a few. So without further ado, my name is Ross Pally, General Manager at Venture Lane. We are a hub and support system for early stage B2B technology companies in the Boston area. And as of late with the virtualization of our program for early stage technology companies everywhere, not just necessarily greater Boston. Uh, very excited here to have Josh Allen, Senior Vice President of Inside Sales and International at Drift. And we also have Jim Nystrom from Cogito Corp, who's the Chief Sales Officer over at Cogito. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Josh. Um, we'll get some, some quick backstories from you both in just a moment. For everyone who's tuned in, topic for today, upselling, or rather how to accelerate upselling of current customers while the cost of acquisition of new customers is obviously higher by default, but maybe a bit higher than, than normal with the, uh, the current climate that we've been in in the last few months. So the idea for this topic came from a previous uh, webinar speaker that we had on about a month ago, Lily Lyman, partner at Underscore VC, who made the very important point um, right now might be a good idea to prioritize the maximization of lifetime value of your current customers, as opposed to going head on into the headwinds that a lot of companies are facing, trying to acquire new ones uh, in, the current, in the current climate. So we have our, our illustrious guests today, Josh and Jim, to help us dive into some key strategies for upselling current customers and maximizing lifetime value of those customers, not necessarily by retaining, we covered that in a previous webinar, but by upselling into higher tiered or, or a bundling of new products. So with that, uh, let's hear from Josh and let's hear from Jim um, how, how they've gotten to where they are today, and then we'll launch into the audience poll. So Josh, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off, um, what are you up to over at Drift and, and what's gotten you to that point? Yeah, so uh, I've been with Drift for just under two years now, I'm responsible for the inside sales organization at Drift, which is, is the majority of our sales team. Uh, we're based in Boston, San Francisco, and now also have an office in Tampa. Uh, but as with all of you, are working remote from our homes, apartments, and any place, frankly, that has a Wi-Fi connection uh, and you're not getting breathed on by another human being. Prior to joining Drift, uh, I spent a little over two years at CarGurus, where we went through a massive growth phase in the company, going from 120 million to about 400 million uh, when I left and, and went through an IPO and sales and customer success team went from 70 to 300. So we, uh, we ripped pretty hard there and had, had a lot of fun doing it as an organization. Uh, and then prior to that, I spent uh, about 10 years with LogMeIn and was there. Um, I was employee number 44 at LogMeIn, so we were like $3 million in revenue and got to see that company go through a bunch of different phases, uh, going through IPO, going international, ultimately up to when they, when they merged with Citrix. So uh, learned a tremendous amount from all of those organizations and, and continue to learn quite a bit today at Drift. Wow, those, <laughs> that's quite a few growth phases for those different companies. Welcome, Josh. Jim, backstory for you. Uh, sure. Good today, everybody. Um, my background really started out of uh, out of college into a startup. Twenty ninth employee um, left there when there was about three hundred. Grew the company from you know little to no millions to you know thirty million there, um, and then moved on to MCI Telecommunications, where you know I worked for then a larger corporation. Took advantage of larger training opportunities and career development. Uh, continued selling uh, telecom and then leading sales teams uh, throughout that uh, experience. Then I went into a startup organization inside MCI uh, that was a contact center business unit. So we were in selling directly to customer care organizations originally. 
Uh, but then we created this little startup business unit with inside this multi-billion dollar corporation um, and then killed it in there selling, you know, over hundred million dollar deals to some of America's largest corporations for their customer care organizations. Um, and then I went to work for a cloud-based company uh, that instead of selling premises-based technologies was selling cloud into contact centers. Um, and then I've been in that business ever since. So for the last, uh, I guess now it's about 15 years, uh, I've been selling to customer care organizations, software as a service, uh, cloud applications, uh, helping them, you know, take and make phone calls and, and provide uh, improved customer experiences. So I'm at Kajito now, uh, coming up on a year. Uh, Kajito is a Boston-based company. Uh, we provide in-call, real-time coaching and guidance to customer service representatives. Um, and the software basically takes the behaviors of the top performers in, a, in an organization and then coaches and guides the rest of the agents or the representatives how to behave or perform like the top performers. So we believe that, you know, 10 or 15% of the people are top performers in an organization and we're helping uh, humans communicate with each other based upon those top performer behaviors, thereby raising up the performance of many more people in the organization to achieve better call outcomes. Wonderful. So plenty of entrepreneurship experience and a bit of entrepreneurship to getting some new, new initiatives going within large organizations. Yep. Wonderful. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Josh. So we'll, we'll go over to the poll in just a moment. Um, for everyone who's tuned in, if you hadn't had a chance to answer that audience poll yet, please do. We will use those answers to guide a lot of our conversation today. And if anyone has any questions for Jim or for Josh at any point, if you hover over the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button. Just hit that button, enter the question you have, and we'll politely interject uh, with Jim and Josh and, and get those questions answered. So before we launch into the poll, um, we'll, we'll get a little bit of a sense or a lay of the land um, at Cogito and at Drift. We'll start, Jim, with you. Um, have you noticed over the past few months, or, or sort of like intentionally so, any, any shift in priorities around the upselling of current customers versus new business initiatives? Any changes to what you guys are measuring as a team when it comes to upselling? Any new approaches? Or has it rather been business as usual compared to pre, pre-COVID times? Yeah, well, it's definitely not business as usual. Um, we're selling into, you know, the Fortune 500 corporations. Um, so we're, we are leaning in heavily on our existing customer base, making sure that our existing customers are as delighted as possible. We're looking for upselling opportunities or cross-selling opportunities within the existing customer base. So that's now the priority for us. Um, and then we're also, you know, continuing to track on new logos as well. Um, but as you can imagine, and I'm sure everyone's experienced, you know, budgets are shifting all over the place right now. So we would be considered a new and emerging and innovative technology. And the customers that we're selling to um, kind of pump the brakes a little bit on new and emerging and innovative technologies in order to reallocate those budgets to <coughs> say maybe work from home initiatives and how are we going to monitor and maintain and, and you know, build up the infrastructure so that everybody can work from home. And that includes not only the customer care re representatives and supervisors that we work with directly, but all of the knowledge workers within an organization, you know, everyone's distributed and at home. So that took a lot of tax on IT resources to in many companies. Uh, it's been interesting to see how smoothly some companies were able to move to work from home. Like, you know, us as an example, um, it was just another day not in the office because, you know, we work remotely from, you know, hotel rooms and airplanes. Um, so it really hasn't had a major impact to us. Uh, but some of the other corporations that are dependent upon people physically being in the same space, you know, and they didn't have the technology in place to go remote. Um, and we're still selling to them. And it's kind of awkward when you're working with some of them sometimes because they don't even know how to use web collaboration tools yet, um, let alone, you know, uh, be ready to work from home. But um, so our company's done well with the transition. Many of our customers have done well. Uh, we are, you know, focusing on the existing base 
And uh, we are certainly focused on anyone that's a new logo that wants to talk to us. We're obviously engaging with them as well. Uh, but those new customers, you know, generally reprioritize budgets and pump the brakes on some of the stuff that we've been uh, bringing to them. Sure, sure. So it sounds like definitely a renewed focus on the current customers, delivering value to them. And on the new customer front, seeing kind of a, a shift in priorities in terms of, of budgets and what those budgets are being used for. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Josh, what's the, what's the status quo over at Drift when it comes to sort of upselling versus new business? Yeah, uh, honestly, I think our focus as an organization hasn't changed all that much um, since the pandemic started. We sell across all different segments, so small businesses, mid-market, enterprise companies, and we sell to all different verticals. So for us, you know, it's, it has more to do with what's happening on the customer end. I think we, didn't, we haven't seen much of a slowdown on the enterprise side as it re- relates to new customers coming in. Uh, and in some cases we've seen acceleration because so drift essentially we are helping companies engage in more conversations with the people who are on their website and we do it through chatbot technology. We do it through automation. So uh, when you think about what has happened in the last three months, many marketing and sales teams who are preparing to have events, uh, dinners, getting on planes, getting on trains, getting in cars and going to visit their customers, that isn't happening anymore. Um, so they had to come up with another way to drive pipeline and engagement with customers. So uh, we've actually had quite a bit of acceleration in certain, certain verticals as a result um, because people are shifting over toward their, their digital transformation projects that have been sitting on somebody's desk for the last three to five years. Uh, so it's been, nice, it's been nice to see that. On the other side, we do have customers who are adversely affected because they were in uh, travel and leisure and hospitality and all of these industries that were were negatively affected. So we have seen we have seen both sides of it. I think as it relates to the split between existing customer focus and new customer focus, um, it hasn't changed in terms of of how we've gone to market. I think we have account management, we have customer success that is focused on our existing customers for both renewal and for upsell opportunities. And so for us, it was a chance to really kind of go back to our existing customer base, make sure that our customers were as healthy as possible. We're getting what they expected to get from the initial business case that was talked about during the sales process. And if not, it was a chance to optimize and spend more time with them. And if they were, it was a chance to really look at where there were other opportunities within the business to get more out of what they were getting from Drift. So it's, it's, Yes, the landscape has changed a little bit, but for us, it's been um, as close to business as usual as, as you could really hope for, I think, in this time. Good, good. So it sounds like kind of a shifting in terms of where marketing and sales budgets are going for different organizations. Yes. How much is clear and then sounds like uh, as good a time as any to be doing plenty of health checks with the current customers and understanding are they, are they receiving the value that they were hoping to get from the product? No doubt about it. Cause if they're not, you're going to be the first vendor out the door. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's turn over to our audience poll quickly. It looks like we have, we have a clear winner. Uh, the second strategy on the list, prioritizing cross selling or bundling of products even for smaller add-ons. So I think, Josh, this is one that, that you mentioned we might add to the list during our prep call. Um, what has been your experience cross-selling, bundling, perhaps at Drift, maybe at other organizations that have logged me in? Um, and what would your advice be for an earlier stage B2B technology company who might not be cross-selling yet, but will be in the near term? Or, or has just started and, and might need to optimize here and there? Yeah, I'd say for, for really early stage companies that have, for the most part, one product to sell that they've gone to market with, yeah. you know, the founders and entrepreneurs in the organizations are looking for adjacent problems and adjacent opportunities to what they're already selling today. So uh, I think the entrepreneurs in those early companies um, can't help themselves. They're always looking for problems that they can solve with, with another product. So I think, you know, like I'll give an example at Drift. Um, we, uh, we are known for a product that is focused on chat. 
but last summer we introduced drift video to the market and with drift the reason we introduced drift video which seems like something completely different from chat is because we wanted to make sure that there were multiple communication channels i think i just froze you're fine you're coming in clear sorry ross i think i froze you're good you're back we wanted to introduce multiple, we knew that the, there were multiple communication channels that were growing in necessity as it related to, to B2B engagement. And so within Drift Video, if you watch a video, you can then also engage with a chat that will connect back to your original salesperson. So it's all, all of those communication channels are essentially coming together in one hub and it allows for a, a continuation of that engagement. That for us was, was natural because we could talk to the same company about how those products connected to each other and how one actually made the other more valuable and better uh, and why their customers, which is ultimately what we are serving, we're trying to make their buyer's journey easier and more elegant, um, why having the two products combined so that you are you are communicating via video, you're communicating on the website via chat, and ultimately that all comes together for one continuous uh, journey. Why that mattered. Um, so it allowed us to have that, that conversation around what are your salespeople on the team using today to effectively communicate when they're prospecting, when they're engaging with existing customers, when they're trying to deliver a tutorial or something that their customers should do if you're in customer success and how that all sort of links together in the one ecosystem. Um, so I do think, I do think if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple products, the question you have to answer is, can you sell that second product to the same buyer that you sold the first product to? If so, it's, it's, it's easier to have that discussion. It's easier to explore that problem. Uh, otherwise, like in the case of Log Me In, where oftentimes we were selling one product to IT, and then potentially selling the other product to a chief information security wow. officer who is like a, a different type of buyer, we had to get referred over to that buyer to be able to have that discussion. So um, depending on who you're selling to and what you're selling, you're always looking for ways to increase the share of wallet to who you're selling to, especially if you can drive additional value with a second product. But it's important as a seller to understand like, can I sell the second product to this individual or do I need to get referred over somewhere else to do it? Yeah, that's an important insight. So are you dealing with uh, this, the same economic buyer at that customer as opposed to having to go back and kind of like restart that sales process altogether with a new person? Yes. Yeah, great insight. Jim, any, any color to add? Any experiences or examples from, from Cogito or, or organizations past? I mean, I think the key things are, um, you know, the better you can know your customer and the better you can understand the business that they're in and the better that you can identify problems that that customer has and then present a solution to them and make it easy and be nimble and responsive, um, you know, the better off you're going to be. I was on a call last week with, you know, one of the world's largest insurance companies and, um, you know, they said, look, we know that we're lethargic and we're bureaucratic and we're hard to work with, but we need more companies like you that are smaller, nimble, innovative, because even though we're one of the world's largest, you know, insurance and financial services companies, we have to be competitive and we can't be competitive without the help from companies like yours. And so, you know, that's refreshing to hear. Um, and then to the point of the, uh, the upsell, uh, so I think my point there is, you know, you can sell to the largest company you want to sell to because they, they are the, smart, the smartest large organizations know that they're not innovative and they need companies like ours that are innovative. So that's one point. On the cross-sell upsell piece, um, you know, I think that I've been through several experiences and you know, when the companies were originally founded or the product was originally created, it was intended to do certain things and be sold in a certain way. And sometimes when you get a little further down the path, you start to pull on the string a little bit and say, well, why do we sell it as one thing? Why don't we, you know, pull this thing apart a little bit and sell it in pieces? 
Um, that way uh, we can charge more instead of it being one bundled solution. You know, we can now look at say, well, now we actually have 10 widgets or SKUs that we can sell. And if a customer buys all 10, we're actually going to get more revenue than selling all 10 as a bundled solution. And so, you know, that, and that could be, you know, in many cases, uh, what my experience has been just with the products that I've sold is they're, they're highly complex. They're sold into very large organizations and they require care and feeding and administration. So, you know, we sell human resources along with the software and, you know, that can also be a very profitable opportunity to sell, um, you know, my, my, my best customers um, always gave me an ID badge to be able to walk into their offices without having to sign the guest book and have somebody come and, you know, take me up to, you know, the meeting rooms. So if you can figure out virtually now or physically, but if you can figure out virtually how you have a, you're part of the team and you're a member of the company or you're, you know, a uh, token employee of your customers, you know, sell that service. So you can be in the meetings that the customer's in, that the other suppliers aren't in, and, uh, you know, be somebody that's a trusted advisor at the table to be able to help them with this innovation and, you know, how to move forward, not only during COVID-19, but during any, any business problem. Um, and the way to look for some of those things in, in the bigger companies, the public companies, if you're selling to them, is to listen to the earnings calls, look at the press releases, read the 10Ks, and look at the job postings on their website. I mean, you'll know what problems they have if you look for who they're hiring and what they're hiring for. So those are just a couple of ways to figure out, you know, without talking to anybody at the company, there's a lot of resources out there on the web that can help you get to know a company, get to know an industry and get to know some people um, and then go after them as targeted individuals. Love those tactics. What are the open job recs for that company? Dial into the earnings calls. Nothing wrong with more information. Also very interesting insight uh, the possibility of unbundling if there's, if there's a uh, sort of like an end to end of products that you're currently providing all in one tier, all for one rolled up price, is there a possibility to unbundle um, and potentially just sell uh, those different products to different customers? In your opinion, Jim, let's say, for example, we have a, an earlier stage tech company tuned in. They have a lot of different functionality all bundled up into one offering and they, they consider doing this, this unbundling. Is it possible that your sales process for those individual products would be a little faster, a little easier if you're selling into a large enterprise as opposed to trying to sell them a product that does a hundred different things at once? Um, I or think it's still subject to the big sort of project managing the big enterprise sales contract? I think the products that I've sold have been pretty focused on customer care, outbound sales, um, contact center related places. And then prior to that, um, you know, at MCI and Verizon, I was selling telecommunications to commercial businesses, state and local government, higher education. And that was almost always an IT sale um, until we, you know, still we, until we got strategic solutions training. Um, that's a, another thing. If you can find some resources on strategic selling, um, that's a great way to pick up on some of the tips that I mentioned earlier about the earnings calls and 10 Ks and job postings and stuff like that. But, you know, thinking about, you know, who is this customer, what matters to them, what are their problems and how can our product help them with their problems? That's, you know, the ultimate goal. Um, I don't think I've really been in a place where I've sold um, to one, having hundreds of products and selling to hundreds of people. I haven't been in that environment. I've been very focused on having probably less than 30 products focused on selling to, you know, key individuals, key roles per se. Sure. So um, probably, probably a bigger determinant of how long that sales process is about to be is what is the department? What is the role that you're selling into at that organization? Yeah. Some prior experience though with the bundled stuff was, um, 
you know, the example there was we, we bundled the product and it was very inclusive, sort of all in one. Yep. And it was very inexpensive compared to the companies that were selling a la carte. <clears throat> and so um, we ran into some sales, uh, some deals that we lost because the customer didn't believe that we could actually deliver all of that in a bundle for that price because they had previously bought from other companies and they bought by a la carte and their aggregate price a la carte was much greater than what our bundled price was. So if that applies to your business, you need to think about how you're going to manage that. Also an important consideration if you're thinking about the potential unbundling of products. Um, so let's jump over to another one of the strategies in the poll. Also got a good number of clicks. We have dedicating someone on your sales or customer success team to the upsell function. So this is a strategy that's highly relevant to an earlier stage technology company where you may not have dedicated folks yet, but this might be a good time to start to think about one or two folks on the team who they are the ones who are trained up on the upsell function and maybe have some KPIs and success metrics attached to their day-to-day -day role that have to do with upselling. Josh, I know you, you added this one to our list during the prep call. Um, your, your experience getting folks dedicated to the upsell function to the first time. And if you have any advice for founders out there who they have one or two people on their team that they have in mind for this, mm -hmm. your advice to them getting those team members kind of dedicated to the upsell function as quickly and successfully as possible. Yeah, I, I think, and, and I think the one caveat I would say is that if, if you're an enterprise focused business selling platforms out of the gate at massive contract values, uh, you probably want to keep it with the person who sold it initially. In addition to adding some strategic post sales, customer success, if it's a post sale solutions engineer, you need to make them successful, whatever it is to support it. But from a sales standpoint, keeping it with the same executive who sold it because that deal probably took a long time to get done and that relationship matters, I would recommend that. That said, with a more transactional, high velocity inside sales motion, um, I'm a big believer in specialization and, and really separating out the customer acquisition function from the existing customer function. Because I think what you need to be able to execute both sides of that successfully for the right outcome um, is a very different focus. And so in the, the last three companies I've been with between LogMeIn, Carvers, and Drift, we, we very much separated those functions. Uh, because when you're, when you're acquiring, you are prospecting, you are cold calling, you are doing cold, like you are trying to get people to the table so you can introduce the value. And whether you're at a, full platform initial sale or a land and expand model, you are introducing somebody to your business, most likely for the very first time. And that takes a certain art of storytelling and selling that is different than what you do with an existing customer and expanding and broadening the relationship to be able to go from maybe your everyday user to developing a relationship with the executive team so you understand how your product or solution uh, rep is represented in their overall strategy. That takes a different level of service and a different level of being able to drive quarterly business reviews with them, make sure they know ahead of time what the product team is working on so they have uh, some visibility into the roadmap and what's being built to solve future problems for them. Um, they're just, they're very, to me, they're very, very different skill sets that individuals have. I think most people are either better at overall hunting or account management and customer success. There's very few who are great at both, although I have seen people who are great at both, but they are the exception versus the rule. So I do recommend specializing there, especially early on when you start to, start to bring some customers in, making sure that you have someone truly dedicated. We, customer success gets thrown around a lot and they have lots of different responsibilities. Sometimes it's renewal, sometimes it's upsell, sometimes it's just the actual health and use of the product itself. Either way, it is all about whether or not that customer is healthy and seeing success and getting out of the product what they expected to when they went through the initial sales process. 
So, um, so I think as an early stage company, it's important to at least have one or two individuals as early as possible assigned to your existing customers because you are going to learn so much from them that frankly, if you have account executives or sellers who just care about bringing in the next, the next logo or the next company or the next new business, they won't take the time to dive deep enough into. That makes sense. That makes sense. So quick follow up. If, if an early stage founder is looking at, looking at the team members that they have and trying to either identify someone who's, who's a good fit for being the dedicated upselling uh, uh, function on the team, or if maybe they decide to open a new role and fill that role externally, um, the other organizations you've been a part of, Car Gurus, Log Me In, or Drift, um, certain behaviors or characteristics that make somebody a really great candidate to be that sort of account executive and be the one who's who's on top of upselling for the team. Yeah, well, history is always the best predictor. So preferably, they've been in a role at a prior place where they've they've had to to play that exact function. Sure. Um, but if you're early stage and you're just bringing kind of newer people in and you're trying to figure out if someone could wear another hat and do something different, uh, I think you're looking for that person who tends to air toward the relationship and going deep on their understanding of the overall business. I think to be a successful account manager, you've got to be deep into the weeds on why they buy your product in the first place what is the actual problem it solves? If they didn't have it, what, what kind of consequences do they suffer by not having it in place? And then is there other application throughout the rest of the business for it? Like, are there other opportunities to do things with it? Um, and then if not, like, who, and then it's just, you know, the basics of selling. Are they, your, are they your primary champion? What happens if they leave the company? Who becomes the point of contact? Do they have executive sponsorship? Who is the economic buyer and how long will they be associated and how long does this contract go before we go into budget discussions again? It's like all of the details because ultimately, um, you know, most companies don't just renew. Oftentimes as a customer success rep or an account manager, you've got to do some reselling as a part of that process and that should be your expectation. And so long as you have a good relationship and you're doing that the whole way, you're presenting the business value in some sort of regular cadence, whether it's monthly or quarterly, whatever your customer wants, that they're seeing firsthand what the value is. And then that value is being communicated up to the proper channels through the economic buyer and the executive sponsor and champion in the business. Yeah. Um, then you can, you can make that renewal and not event. But oftentimes we hear that a contract comes up, it's up for renewal and they're not sure if they're going to keep it. That means that all of the steps weren't being followed along the way to make sure that they're healthy and successful. Important, important point. So great segue into another one of our strategies, uh, speeding up renewal conversations by offering better pricing for longer duration. So we don't necessarily have to go too into, uh, should you be speeding up the renewal conversation and offering different terms? Probably uh, the best use of time right now is to hear from uh, the both of you. We'll go to Jim first, and then we'll go to Josh. When that time for renewal comes, um, what are some of the best practices you would recommend for having that renewal conversation, not just be a continuation of the same level of business, but maybe delivering more value um, at a higher at a higher price tier? So, Jim, bet, uh, one or two quick um, best practices for how to turn a renewal conversation into an upsell conversation. Yeah, so my my experience in the last uh, 15, maybe even 25 years, if I think back about it, um, the first company I was at, there wasn't, uh, there was expanding product, but it, uh, it, it sold out within an organization um, throughout the enterprise at the beginning. So there wasn't really much of an upsell unless new products came out. Mm -hmm. But the last uh, 20, 25 years that I've been in this customer care contact center space, it's been a little different where, you know, we've won, you know, one or more lines of business, but we have not won, you know, the entire enterprise, for example. So, you know, on a renewal basis, you know, I'd get ahead of, you know, making sure that you've identified other lines of business that could use your product, um, how you can solve those problems in that line of business, 
Ideally, you will have already proposed to those other lines of business and gotten some feedback so that when you get into the renewal conversations and your buyer or procurement is trying to, you know, get your widget for half the price they paid for it the first time, you know, basically ask them internally, you know, help me, you know, recover this by, you know, you may be able to give them 25% off that price, but in exchange for that, you know, I want to get my product into other lines of business. So you can actually increase your ARR rather than decreasing your ARR. Um, and then uh, the other possibility is if you can't make it up internally, um, then see if you can make it up externally and ask that customer to be a partner of yours and uh, be a reference, you know, on some type of a regular cadence. Um, ask them to do press releases with you. Ask them to do recorded webinars for, you know, digital content to be used later. Um, you know, there's a number of things, data sheets, case studies, all that stuff, so that if you can't make up the revenue within the existing customer, maybe they can help you, you know, by being a partner and you can win more deals um, by leveraging this person as a partner rather than uh, just making it up internally. Great insight. So very helpful how to uh, guide if, if you find that a renewal conversation is actually moving in the opposite direction of what you anticipated. Are there other lines of business to explore within the organization? Yes, no. If yes, pursue. If no, can that customer be a partner in, um, in bringing on new business elsewhere? It's a very helpful. I think every customer, I mean, every customer understands that every business wants to grow. So it would be unrealistic for any customer of yours to think that you're in business of decreasing revenue um, because they're certainly not in the business of decreasing revenue. So you know, just remind them that, you know, we're both here for the same purpose and it's to grow and make money. Let's figure out a way that we can do it together. Of course, of course. Uh, Josh, any, any color to add? Renewal conversations coming up, key insights um, for a founder who maybe wants to have that be an upsell opportunity if possible. Yeah, well, the other thing I want to hit on is you mentioned like whether or not we do like a multi-year contract extension at renewal in addition to potentially having some upsell opportunities. So I would say to the founders out there, um, give some strong consideration to your incentive structure for the sales team and the people on your customer success team as it relates to that. And if you want longer term contracts, so there are fewer times you have to go to the table with a procurement team, go to negotiation, see what the discount's gonna be, uh, and set longer term deals for your team so that if they close a two year renewal contract, uh, the, the account manager or the customer success manager who's responsible for it gets some sort of a bonus or gets a kickback for, for doing that. Because ultimately it makes, it makes it easier on your company because you're spending less legal resources hitting the red lines again, finance resources who are going through the terms of the agreement, your account manager or customer success rep who's having to negotiate that. And then on the customer side, they're having to do the exact same thing. If you have to go to the table every 12 months, that can be a drain on both organizations having to go through that. So I would recommend incenting um, longer term, like two and three year contracts within the customer success organization. And, and there's no doubt that if a renewal process, and remember, a renewal process is not when the contract is up. It is happening the whole way along during the contract. And so I think very strong customer success and account management organizations have built out a process that has those milestones along the way that you expect to be hitting. And if you enter into a red zone when you're 90 to 120 days from the time of renewal and the health of the customer is low based on whatever your proxy measurement is, uh, it is time to buckle down and make sure that, again, like looking back to the original business case that they bought from, if we're not meeting that, what can we do quickly to ensure that we're getting the customer there before you start to get into what can be really you know, difficult dollars and cents conversations if your product's not driving the expected value it was supposed to? Okay. So the renewal process, this is not one date on the calendar at the time that the contract is up. This is a process that you're delivering on for, for months and quarters beforehand. It is evergreen. As soon as they sign up, it, like, you know, the, when you think about it, a new customer comes in and they sign up and the account executive many times is done with that. But the, the hard work for the customer often is just beginning because they're going to go through the implementation. They're going to get to use the product. They're going to learn how to use the product. 
But whether or not they renew at the end of that contract, they're making those small micro decisions all along the way. And, and so you have to think of the renewal process as their constant ongoing experience with your business, with your company, with the people, and with the product itself. Renewals are evergreen. Okay. I would, I would encourage everybody to start with your contract if you can figure out a way to make it an auto renewal. So maybe the initial term is one year, two year, three years, but then it auto renews for one year periods after that. If you have to back down from that, you can say it auto renews monthly after the initial term. Um, but you know, if you can get away to have an auto renewal in the contract, it doesn't relieve you of the responsibilities of continuing to win the customer's business, you know, day after day and month after month. Um, but it takes away some of that procurement heartache that, you know, it has a hard stop after three years and you got to renegotiate the whole thing. So important consideration. So we have four minutes to go. I think we have time for maybe quick thoughts from Jim and quick thoughts from Josh on one last strategy here that was one of the more popular ones. So a good thing that we hit it before 1245. And that was the first strategy on the list, training support teams to spot upsell opportunities and communicate those opportunities to sales or to customer success. Um, so Jim, we'll start with you. Um, maybe what are, what are some of the signals that uh, support teams can be trained to identify and then communicate to sales and customer success as possible upsell opportunities? Yeah, so this happens, you know, with the companies I've worked for and also with the, you know, customer care organizations that I work with. You know, whether you're the largest healthcare, insurance, financial services, telecommunications carrier, if there's an inbound phone call to them, <clears throat> meaning the customer is calling you, that is an opportunity for you to find a way to sell them something else. So I would strongly encourage everybody to look for ways to not just seek to understand what the current ask is, but what is it that I can propose back to this caller that might be interesting to them <clears throat> or to someone else in the organization. To operationalize it, I would uh, use the CRM to have that support person enter a lead into the CRM and have the lead assigned to uh, support and then to that particular rep. And then let sales pick up the newly created lead and then go qualify it and see if they can actually figure out you know, something that they can go sell there. And if they do sell something, the fact that you created the lead initially and it gets associated with the opportunity uh, that support rep can then be at least recognized for doing that, if not financially compensated, you know, based upon the number of opportunities that were created or the value of the deals that came as a result of that. And, you know, anyone in support or service loves the opportunity to be associated with a deal and making more money. Great. So very, very easy routine to implement, just having that support representative enter a lead, but the value that can come from that externally for the customer, but internally that individual getting recognized and the actual identification of an upsell opportunity. Um, so easy to implement. Seems like there's great value relative to how, how much work it takes just to start doing that routine. Josh, any color to add on this one? Yeah, I, I agree a lot with what Jim had to say. I think the best execution of this I saw in my career was, uh, was at LogMeIn. We had a we had a pretty good size, what we called user services team, which was a, a blend of um, support and kind of light selling. And, and, but they were, part of their compensation was tied to the leads that they were identifying. And then we had the ROEs built in. So if they entered a case ticket in Salesforce, they could enter a lead, uh, enter some information about the lead. And we had the routing built within Salesforce that it would get routed to the right account executive who could pick it up and take it from there. Um, but it was a part of their overall variable compensation structure. It worked incredibly well and drove an awful lot of business for us. Great. Great. Again, sounds, sounds easy enough outsider looking in sounds easy enough to implement, but um, the, the value that can accrue seems, seems rather high relative to how easy it is. So we're coming up on 1245. That is it for today's content. Thank you, Josh Allen from Drift. And thank you, Jim Nystrom from Cogito. Thank you for making the time. I'm sure everyone tuned in appreciates the really tactical conversation today, how you can accelerate upselling and kind of hit some more success metrics on the upselling side in the current climate. 
Thank you both. Thanks to all those who tuned in and, and answered our audience poll. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Let's sell something. <laughs> <laughs>